It's story time with your creepy Uncle Jizzo. What's up, you guys? Troll Pal Jizzo here for story time part two. Let's get creepy. This one is off my book. I got more crickets and friends. <clears throat> Sold out, of course, but. If you did get lucky enough to get one while they were still available down here at this site, you could uh, read along. So uh, here we go. This one's called House Party. Like a swarm of locusts they came. Like a stampede of wild buffalo they came. Drunken, unruly, they came from all corners. They came to hear music to look at chicks, to be in the hurricane's eye for one night. This was the house party. I'd done a million, this was just one. I went to the doctor yesterday, Ted said, as he was taking a bong hit. Yeah, what for, I said. My lungs hurt. From what, I said. That's what I went to the doctor for. He hooked me up to some machine to measure my lung capacity. Then he said the funniest thing, he said, are you bonging quaaludes? Like he knew exactly what was wrong with me. It didn't surprise me that Ted bong quaaludes. He put anything in a bong, pack it tight and fire it up. Pills, thrills, pot, angel dust, romaine lettuce, anything. He was one of those remarkable people that truly didn't give a shit. He never thought that he was gonna die. Ted and I were in a local band that played backyard parties for money. Ted, through his intricate network of friends, always found some unsuspecting young girl and convinced her that the key to her future lay in hosting a house party. Leave it to us, he said. We'll do all the work. We'll bring the beer and the gear and charge admission. You just sit back and bask in the glow of your newfound popularity. And we spent many a summer doing just that. We'd pull up to the house like Visigoths and leave a scorched, burning hulk in our wake. And so it begins. You know, when I look back as a kid, I wonder if I ever really experienced a truly sober moment. Ever. Your first bong hit, first thing in the morning, truly dictated the rest of the day. You're stoned immaculate and warm and fuzzy, the simple act of making hash browns turned into an adventure worthy of Jack London. You know, MTV guided our precious little attention span back then. It showed you the way. This way, boys, it said. Pick up a guitar, pick up a microphone. This is the path to greatness. Never work a real job in your life. All the duck, 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 duck you can eat. And we believed. I sat there like Brigham Young glued to that set, soaking up every nuance. The bedroom mirror was my audience and my fan club back then, posing in the mirror for my legion of soon-to-be adoring fans. Got another party this weekend, Ted said. Cool, I said. Where? Some rich chick's house. Her parents are leaving for the weekend. Hmm, excellent. That was good. See, we lived adjacent to a rich neighborhood called Woodland Hills in California, where there was no end of rich kids trying to one-up each other in that weekend party world. Come Saturday night, some sheltered rich girl would become host and party girl. She would open up those doors her parents slaved half their lives for and put the whole thing up for auction. Her plants would be trampled, her fish would die, her swimming pool would become a fetid swamp, all in the name of rock. Well, thank God for rock. The day came. We all met at our guitar player's house to load up the equipment in his beat up old Ford. He lived in the back bedroom of a house that he shared with his old gray mother. She was ageless, the mummy's ghost. She was Norman Bates's mother. Rocking chair, meat cleaver, wig, everything. She would always be yelling at us, 
You're too loud, she said, or what's wrong with your eyes, she said. <clears throat> she didn't miss a trick. So we loaded up the amps and guitars and the kegs of beer that we purchased and trotted off to the land of the rich and the privileged, Woodland Hills, one neighborhood that was soon to know true anarchy a legion of cars and screaming dudes and loud Led Zeppelin and beer bottles thrown and girls puking in rose bushes and always, always music. Music as only music can be appreciated. Music for the young, the unjobbed, the unmarried with kids, the unencumbered with bothersome chains of conformity. Music pure and savage. Music felt in the pit of one's stomach as a turning force and a teacher and a lover. All the beautiful emotions spun like a silk cocoon. Excitement, joy, lust, power, animal reflex, instinct, like a pride of lions sated with their first kill, blooded. Let the beer flow and the carnage begin. Ted and I walked up to the door. He was there to depth charge any second thoughts this girl might have about hosting our little book burning. She answered the door. She was a typical Jewish American princess, pretty, aloof, snobby. She probably had a Mexican maid to comb and braid her ass hairs. We set up our gear in front of a pair of huge glass doors that faced outside to the patio and the backyard, obviously, because this is where the mob would assemble and eventually riot. Okay, guys, bring in the stuff. In came the speakers, the martial amps, the PA gear, the lights. I proceeded to set up the PA and the equipment while Ted smoothed the girl over. You know, she actually had big bowls of chips and dip set out in the kitchen, like the Partridge family was coming over. Jesus, she had no idea. No idea at all. By that time, some of her other friends had come over to help set up. And they all looked at us from the other side of the valley, like we had typhus, like a simple handshake would give them polio. You see, we were from the other side of Ventura Boulevard, where people had no dreams or aspirations, where teenagers weren't just given BMWs for graduation, where kids didn't go to spring break and drink strange pink concoctions out of a tortoise shell and lose their virginity on some strand of beach. So we turned the equipment on and we ran through a few songs. We played Led Zeppelin, Ted Nugent, The Scorpions, all the favorites. What we lacked in talent, we more than made up in our amateurness. Me with my $4 tambourine, shaking my ass like one of the Archies. Ted banging away on his drum kit, his huge <laughs> swinging out of one side of his boxer shorts like a big purple bell. Guitars and bass and white noise and feedback, the sum total of decibels directed towards us, the troubadours, the entertainment. Then, remarkably, out of nowhere, the parents showed back up. They had forgotten something, I don't know, a passport, something. They walked in their front door to find a group of total strangers, us, drinking and banging out the song remains the same in their living room. In their living room. I bet they didn't even let company in their living room. The look on their faces was priceless. They would have been no more shocked if we had had white hoods on burning a cross. What the hell is going on here? The father screamed. Natasha, where are you, Natasha? Natasha came running into the living room like she just shit her pants clean through to the seat. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. We're just having a party. Uh, just a few friends, she said hurriedly. Who the hell are these people? And by that, he meant us. They're friends of mine, she said. We're just playing music, that's all. And herein comes the magic. Like Merlin of old, my friend Ted appeared before them. He shook the father's surprised hand. He introduced himself as the band's manager. He flattered, he cajoled, he sang and he danced, and he actually, he actually convinced the parents 
to let the party go on. That he, Ted, the gilded ambassador of goodwill, would make sure that the noise was kept to a minimum and that their property wouldn't be harmed. I couldn't believe it. It was, it was truly unbelievable. I, I, I was watching John Wilkes Booth get Mr. Lincoln to take his seat again and watch the play. I was watching Kennedy take the top down and wave to the grassy knoll. This, this man, this learned man, this doctor, property owner, was going to put his whole house and home in the hands of Ted, the dope dealer, the quaalude bonger. I, I was in the company of genius. The mother went upstairs and retrieved her passport and, and Ted hustled the two of them out the door with assurances of trust and the justice of a thousand benevolent Buddhas. When he came back in, we actually applauded. Ted bowed. Now let's get this party going, he said. At approximately eight o'clock, the people started coming. We had put the directions for the party on an answering machine, so they came. They came in convoys of 10 or 12 cars. They came with stereos blasting and beer and bravado. We had to start playing fairly early, you see, because the cops would surely come. They always did. It was always a race to get the most people in and the most money before one of the neighbors invariably called the police. The backyard was filling up slowly, almost casually, the damage began. It started with a few trampled flowers, then the cigarette butts started to burn holes in the expensive astroturf surrounding the pool. The bottles accumulated, the joints were passed, the community gathered like the Quakers of old. They gathered to discuss the day's business. Who went to the beach that day? Who had the best pot? Who bought the new Scorpions record? Who got new mag wheels on their van? This was the valley, a microcosm, a single cell in this organism called Los Angeles. So people were slowly filtering into the house now. Natasha started freaking out because all of a sudden she had to share her little dollhouse existence with the rest of uh, white trash valley society. Unfortunately, this only made her drink more and the drunker she got, the less in control the situation, you know, became. So it was time to start playing. We always opened with the immigrant song by Led Zeppelin. I was one of the few singers that could do that trademark scream at the beginning. And I was always proud of that. And then we went right into rock and roll and the Rover, then how many more times? These are all Led Zeppelin songs to the uninitiated. And I, I suggest you all go out and listen to them. Listen well, for they define our generation. People cheered, they raised their glasses, they howled at the moon. Also hidden deep within the noise of the amplifiers and the screaming vocals were the telltale sounds of the broken glass. Little knickknacks bought from vacations in Acapulco. Things accumulated in the house from years and years of luxury and travel started falling to the ground and got stepped on. I heard it, of course. I wish I could say I stopped it, but I didn't. Then I raised my hand and I said, brother, stop this carnage before it's too late. I wish I could say that I did that, but I didn't, I didn't. I let it go on. I watched it all go on and I secretly got off on the fact that the poor man was finally scoring one over the rich man. Maybe for another half hour or so, the playing field would be level. So we played and played and the people cheered and the house started to come apart, one little glass elephant at a time. And then, of course, the cops came. The helicopter came first, its powerful beam shining down on us from on high, the light diffusing through the trees, giving the whole backyard sort of a mirror ball effect. People raised their middle fingers in defiance and they cheered. Cops are here, I said. So what, Ted said, emptying a beer. Let's keep playing. You always took a chance when you did that. 
See, if you just stopped playing, the cops were usually pretty cool and they didn't roust anyone. If you kept playing, though, anything could happen. So we kept on playing. And pretty soon, pretty soon there came a pounding on the front door. People looked through the curtains. It was the cops, obviously, doing their thing. Natasha couldn't even answer the door. She had actually passed out in her upstairs bedroom, face down on her bed, a drunken goddess casting her fate to the four winds. Then there came a severe pounding, not like a hand or a boot, a different sort, this. I watched, singing my song and shaking my ass, and then I saw it, an ax coming through the door. They were taking an ax to the door now, like firemen, like clansmen. They were going to destroy that expensive French door in the name of the law. So I decided it was time to cut and run. Dude, they're coming in, I said. Ted looked. Right, let's pack up and split. See, I was stoned and I had pot in my back pocket. So I split. I went out the back door into the backyard and I joined the hundreds of anonymous long hairs in the backyard. The outdoors was chaos. Someone had thrown all the furniture into the pool. The chairs and the tables sat at the bottom, frozen like the Titanic. There was trash and bottles and cigarette butts and all the nice flowers were either trampled underfoot or yanked up in anger. I watched a friend of mine tried to melt a lawn chair with a road flare he had in his hand. He was concentrating, serious, as he melted the plastic ribs together, the black smoke rising like steam. He vandalized for no reason mature man knew. He destroyed and he broke and he melted things because it was somehow fun to do so. The joy of glass breaking, the erotic sound of breaking glass or pottery, the primeval power of fire, the power to burn and destroy that way. I mean, somehow it pushed buttons that seem silly now as adults. It was fun to see shit destroyed and it was fun to drive drunk and somehow outwit the law. It was fun to smoke more dope than was humanly possible. And there was no AIDS or herpes and nobody got pregnant. There was always TV to help tell us what to do and what to buy and what to be. There were drive-in movies and vinyl records and the microwave oven was a new thing and bell bottoms and mood rings and magic mushrooms and no f***ing responsibilities in the entire world. Music was done for sheer pleasure and not a paycheck. Music was all consuming. Music could be slowly listened to and digested like beef. It could be talked about and loved and the emotion was there. The emotion was there. You liked something, you loved something. It evoked a response. It pushed a button deep inside you. Something deep within the clouded mind of an adolescent and it really meant something. Somehow, it really, really did.